What's up, Hyperfast Agent Nation? On this episode, we have an amazing guest. He's a serial entrepreneur, has built an amazing business, Carrot, which helps real estate agents build evergreen content, content that generates leads forever. Welcome to the show, Trevor Mock. Welcome to the show, Trevor. How are you doing today? Dan, doing, doing great, man. Pumped to be on here with you guys. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. I know you've got a ton of amazing experience starting multiple companies, scaling, uh, and a lot of lessons that you can teach real estate agents, investors, and really just anybody that wants to, to, to do more good stuff. Uh, mm. Before we jump into all that great stuff, though, why don't you give the, the listeners today, the people watching, a little bit uh, about you, who you are, how you got to where you are today. Cool, dude. So, so for, first of all, I kind of set the context right before we hit record. Um, you know, we talked about where I live and I don't live in the traditional area that a tech company would be or like this booming real estate market, but I live in a small town in Oregon uh, called Roseburg. And, and the, the reason I think that's important is because uh, as, as I was looking at growing my businesses over the years, I was asked like, what are those non-negotiables for me? And, and how do I build a business around those? And one of those, you know, I wanted to make sure to build it anywhere I wanted to live. And so we live in, in a very small town and that's part of our mission, dude, is helping to build a business and make uh, this town thrive even more on the entrepreneurial side. But- how'd you, pick, um, how'd you pick Roseburg? Was it, was it, you grew up there or just saw the magazine or family there? <laughs> dude, uh, re- really good question. So I, I grew up in Oregon, a, another small town, like three hours on the other side of the Cascades. And Roseburg was always kind of one of those spots where I never thought I would live, but roundabout way, um, I graduated college. Uh, when I was a junior, a junior in college, I got into real estate and I bought my first four unit, four unit building, literally like Carlton Sheets stuff, like literally the course, you know, the no money down. So I bought a four unit building. And then after that, we moved to Portland. My wife got her medical degree and then Roseburg was where uh, the first job was that she liked. And uh, for us, we thought it was going to be a two-year stint, man. We thought a couple years, have her get some experience and we'll move to Bend or back up to Portland or something. Uh, but we've just found that we really love uh, the small town. And when, when, when you can finally decide to say, hey, you know what? This town may not be perfect, but we can be a part of making it amazing, a part of making it what we want. Uh, that's when mission and purpose started to creep in and like, all right, we're staying here. So we, we love it here now. Yeah, it's cool to see. So my my you know my wife Carrie, she's she's from a small town in Oregon, uh, a couple hours north of of Roseburg actually. So yep. it's 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 definitely cool getting out there and and uh, you know seeing those 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 small communities. Oregon's beautiful, man. I I, I love it. I, I love traveling, but Oregon, like every time you fly home, you see the green. You know, in the airport, it's like right, I'm I'm back home. It feels good. Um. Yeah, so so you want to design a life, a business that would allow you to to be in a place like Roseburg, right? Uh, so what what next? <laughs> yeah, so no, for sure. So what what we do today, I'll kind of fast forward. Um, yeah, I own a company called Carrot uh, Carrot dot com, and we primarily help real estate investors and increasingly so real estate agents who kind of want to get off the marketing hamster wheel, you know, where they're like, Oh my gosh, the marketing that I'm doing is working, but it's wearing me out. It's inconsistent. If I take a month vacation, my marketing stops and we help people build an evergreen marketing, which we could talk about that here in a bit. But um, the way, the way that I got there, man, was, you know, after college went up to, to Portland and, and this is where I first started to dig in and go, man, like, what do I want to do with myself? Um, I, I knew that I liked real estate because I got I bought that first rental property that it cash flowed. But for for in, for agents listening to this, if you have any rental properties, uh, if you buy you know single family properties, those first few probably aren't going to make you a lot of money, if not you know the first ten. And so most of that money, if not all of it, just went into the bank to pay for roofs and painting and stuff like that. 
And I started to dive in and, and discover, I'm like, man, I really like this marketing thing. I, I, I love the idea of figuring out how to uh, connect with people and, and their wants and needs, educate them, like selling by education, not selling by selling hard, and then deliver that value. And then only then they'll go, oh, cool. Well, it'd be amazing if you could solve that thing for me. And so, Dan, that's what I did, man. Uh, in, in that that time period, that would have been 2008 or so. I just dug into the internet, uh, a mortgage broker uh, who was my uncle. He, he walked into that, that office uh, that I was getting paid a thousand dollars a month to sit at his office, cold calling Craigslist leads uh, for his mortgage business, uh, Fizbo's. He said, pull up, pull up the, uh, pull up your computer screen. And he said, can you Google like mortgage brokers, Portland, Oregon? I go, okay. I Googled it, you know, it pops, you know, Google search. And he goes, how do I get there? Cause you guys, I think my best clients are going to be there. Like the people who are the most motivated, they're actively looking for a solution. He's like, what if I could get there? And that kind of started that journey for me, Dan, of learning how the internet works to bring those best leads, to bring the most motivated leads. And fast forward five years, uh, I had big corporate clients that we did that for, um, tons of real estate investors and our clients bring in, uh, it's about 90,000 leads a month right now that are inbound leads, mostly sellers. Um, and that kind of brings us back to, back to today and what we do and kind of the, the high level of how, how I got to this spot. There's so many gaps in between that are trials, tribulations, mindset shifts, all that kind of stuff. How, how has it evolved since then? So, you, you know, 2008, when you started, that was a, uh, a while ago. Yep. SEO has changed. Google has changed. You know, Facebook and wasn't that wasn't as big back then. Instagram nope. wasn't even around, uh, you know, TikTok, all these new platforms weren't around. So like how, how has the, the long form evergreen, you know, mm-hmm. content strategies, how, how has it evolved over that time? And where, do you, so, where do you see it going? Man, so, such a good question because uh, th- this is one of the biggest misnomers that I'll find in the retail side of real estate, right? Where on, on, on the retail side of it, um, I think real estate agents are, are so ingrained to think of online marketing in a couple ways. Uh, number one, today, online marketing is seen as Zillow, is seen as posting on Facebook or Facebook ads or posting on Instagram. And now, now maybe some TikTok, right? And so that, that's the way that online marketing has started to mature for people. But back then in 2008, um, it was literally about sitting down and going, how, how do I find out what people are searching online, the people that I can help? And then can I write content or record a video? But it's all, it's all about writing the content at that time. It still is today. How do I write content that is valuable enough that Google's going to think it's really relevant to that search phrase? So as an example in Arlington, right? Like if someone needed to sell their house really fast, they might go to Google and literally type, sell my house, Arlington, Virginia, or sell my house fast, Arlington, or in any array of, of things, right? And so Google's going to look at that content and it's, it's going to say, well, what, what do I think is the most trustworthy source? Uh, what do I think is going to be the, the highest value to the person doing the search? Because if Google serves up crappy, crappy results, people aren't going to go back to Google. They're going to go to Bing or, you know, something like that. And so back then, man, it was still the same thing that it, that it is today as far as creating robust, valuable content. The, the difference in 2008 was you could game it easier. In 2008, mm-hmm. you could you could pull up your page and like stuff eight million you know keywords in there, or you could do little little things that weren't adding value to the searcher or to Google. And you could like literally go to the bottom of the page, put all your keywords in there, and then change the color of those words to white. So the so the so the Google can see it, but the viewer can't see it. And it's when 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 you think about it, Dan. Anytime there's something in its early phase, whether it's a marketing method, you know, uh, Clubhouse, dude, Cl- Clubhouse is the latest thing coming out right now as we're speaking. Uh, it's the Wild West and people find ways to game those things really fast. But smart systems, smart tools, Facebook, Instagram, you know, Google, they eventually been pretty quickly realized, oh my gosh, this is about user experience. And we've got to make sure that people can't game it and we're delivering the best experience. So those are the main things. You can't game it as easy but the fundamentals are the same that you need to create robust content, a website that loads really fast. So that increases that user experience, a website that's easy to navigate. So it goes back to user experience, right? And content that is, you know, robust. It's gotta be at least five to 800 words on a page for it to really rank these days. Back then you could put, you could put two or 300 words on a page 
and it would have a chance of ranking for a competitive phrase like a best real estate agents in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, but today you've got to put more content on the pages. Yeah. So it's gotta be the, the, the trickery kind of stuff has evolved, but really that's, that's short lived at best. But mm -hmm. the, the good thing to, to know is that if, if you make good stuff, uh, relevant, interesting and robust, yep. that it'll, that it'll stay up there. Have, have you been on clubhouse by the way? You mentioned that I've, I've been on that a, a couple of times, hosted a few rooms, but I'm just curious if you've, if you've, played around with it yeah dude it's 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 so interesting because when i first heard about clubhouse i'm going like that's the worst idea ever that's not gonna that's not gonna catch on who's gonna want to just literally tune into audio only and you can't chat to people back and forth on text uh it's addicting man uh so what what, what i'll do now dan is uh, i'm doing 75 hard uh, the the mental and fitness yeah and i did a different challenge where i rode 500 miles the month of december uh, and that might be something to talk about, dude, like just how to hone your mental side of the game with physical challenges. Um, but what I'll do now is I'll literally pull up clubhouse while I'm out there doing a you know, 45 minute workout outside. I'll listen in, I'll get brought up to the top and do some speaking. So it's, it's been an interesting experience to, to get to see a system at its ground level, uh, as people are just learning how to use it so much value over there though, dude, so much. Yeah. It's, it's been, I've been on there and I've, I've like, heard grant cardone and russell brunson and you know a lot a lot of cool people weighing in and then just like you know people of you know not as high up the business yeah. uh ladder if you will uh just it can be a big just, time suck though that's for sure it's like yeah you gotta, you gotta give it a be. box and window i i think it's uh i think one of the things that's valuable about it and i don't know if this will be a quick you know, flash in the pan or if it will stick around. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple things interest me though. One is this, it's like a social media app that's not starting with young people, right? Yep. Like, like, you know, Instagram, TikTok, they, they all kind of started with young and then aged up. And mm -hmm. this, I haven't seen that on, on this at least. Yep. Um, so that's been interesting to me. And then the other thing that's, that I think is kind of unique about it is it, it, it doesn't have as much toxicity i think as other social media like you know twitter facebook um there, there's definitely some good in there and, and connecting people but there's mm -hmm. there's a lot of like low forms of communication that go on there and like you just that, a lot of that's kind of eliminated in this clubhouse format so it's, it's interesting to watch there, there's, there's a couple things on on that that i want to kind of kind of dig into and, and you're 100 right because like with the other social media and we'll kind of, we'll kind of pull it back to real estate agents marketing, right? Uh, with the other social media, you know, let's say you're doing a Facebook ad and it's a video or whatever. Uh, I think every agent or investor listening to this can relate to the, uh, when someone leaves a snarky comment on their Facebook ad, because anyone can make a comment on anything that they see. Uh, with Clubhouse, you have to, you have to be like brought up by a moderator in order to say anything. And, and I think that self filters some things out. Now, there probably are going to be some people who slip through and they say something and they immediately get you know, muted. And, that, and that's, that's that. But one thing that I love the most about it, Dan, is this is, and, and this kind of goes back to marketing. This goes back to a concept that I, that I mentioned earlier of getting off of the marketing hamster wheel, right? Where um, so much of social media, well, number one, agents pull tons of leads and deals out of social media. Like, if it's working for you guys, you shouldn't stop it. You should keep on doing it and just find ways to make it better. The problem with it is though, like we were talking before, you make a post on Facebook or you may make a post on Instagram. Uh, it's only got, you know, 72 hour time span to really uh, see, you know, have, have the majority of people see it. And then it goes down the feed and then you got to create another one. You got to create another one. It's all really short form uh, interactions. Uh, with short form interactions, short form content, you're catching attention but oftentimes you're not able to, to bring someone down to the full sale or really build a relationship. And what we're finding with Clubhouse is it's, a, it's the opposite. It's long form, man. There's, there's some uh, Clubhouse rooms or whatever they're called over there. There's some that I've seen that are going for seven hours, eight hours, 10 hours, two days, uh, where moderators are swapping in and out. And the thing I love about it is it's getting people absorbed back into the fact that long form content uh, when you're able to really have a real conversation and really solve people's problems, it's building trust and credibility faster than ever. 
Um, followings are happening over there amazingly well. People are going from Clubhouse over to Instagram and we're getting business from that because we were able to talk to someone for five or 10 minutes on Clubhouse. And they're like, damn, that person knows what they're talking about. I can trust them. Now let me come over here and do business with them. So it, it, it will be interesting seeing what, what it does and, and, and seeing how real estate agents might be able to use it to grow their businesses. So you've, you've talked a little bit about long form, short form, right? And like, mm -hmm. and there, there's an actual chart of this that's really interesting where it's like a tweet lives for 14 minutes, Instagram posts yep. is like five hours, LinkedIn posts maybe a, a day and, you know, blog and YouTube, those, those can last for like years uh, yep. on this chart. Clubhouse in, in the advantage of the long form is like, if you make a good piece, it's, it's, you know, it's there forever, right? On, yep. You know, on Google searches, like your Instagram posts, your tweet, it's not. Uh, Clubhouse was probably going to be in the the shorter side of this, right? I mean, it's not even mm -hmm. archivable, right? It's now. instant, dude. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's only instant. <laughs> like if you're listening to that in, the, in that moment, it, you know, you can listen to that. that. That will be the interesting thing with, with Clubhouse though, is, is seeing if they do add some sort of archiving feature to it, because I totally can see that. I, I think part of the reason Clubhouse is growing so much right now is because there's FOMO. You know, it's like, I know that there's not a recording, so I have to hop on there and just see what's going on. And th they've got to keep an element of that to keep that growing uh, for sure. Yeah. So how much, uh, you know, let's, let's put aside, like if, if an agent's already killing it on Instagram or, or having success with, you know, one of these other platforms, but like mm -hmm. just in general, how much time, how much, like, you know, if you're advising a real estate agent, how much percentage of their, their overall effort should they be focused on long form evergreen content versus the, the hamster wheel stuff? Well, Dan, Dan I mean, it, it's, it's such a good question. I'm going to, I'm going to take a couple steps back here because um, let, let me relate to part of my story and why I ended up making like the full, full on shift towards, um, towards evergreen. And I amp amplify it with paid or hamster wheel. I do that. This, this goes back to is probably is around 2011 or 12. And uh, I'd, I'd been in business for three or four years and some other online businesses. And I don't know if anyone can relate, but you, you have this vision, right? You, you've got this vision of, man, when I become an entrepreneur, or if you're a real estate age, agent listening to this, you have this vision of, man, when I become a real estate agent, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get freedom, right? I'm going to get flexibility. And I'm doing this because I get to set my own schedule and all these things. And what ended up happening to me with my previous businesses was, I had that vision and then I created a business and it was built off of hamster wheel marketing. It was built off of, I have to go do this thing. And as long as I'm doing this thing, it works. But if I want to take a week off or a month off um, and I don't have a team built to do that thing for me when I'm gone, what happens is your leads start to go down, your income starts to go down. And then you come back a week, a month, you know, whatever it is, three months later, your income is in shambles because your lead flow stopped or your ability to work on it while you're taking that break stopped. And uh, I remember waking up, you know, one day in 2011, we had just had our, our daughter, she's a little over a year old at that point, our, our oldest. And I remember there, being there at like 10 o'clock in the morning when I should have been working. And I had, you know, from the outside in, everyone would look at it and go, man, he's making, you know, six figures as a mid 20 something year old guy. He's got a beautiful wife, a healthy young daughter. Um, just from the outside in, it was kind of like, man, I had, I had everything that I would have dreamt, dreamt of, but I wasn't grateful. Right. And so I'm looking at it go, man, I don't want to get up to do the work that I had created for myself. Um, yes, there's good money and all that kind of stuff, but I was starting to feel empty inside about does my work matter? Um, man, I'm serving this business. It's not serving me. Uh, if, if you picture a, if you picture like an analogy of a, a stool and if you picture like you're sitting on a stool and this stool has one leg on it, okay? One leg on it, meaning one marketing method or one channel or one person or whatever it is that's, that's holding that up. If you get off of that stool and you wanna take a break, if you get off of that business, if you take a vacation, that stool falls over. Like it can't stand by itself. And that's how I was at that time when I was getting just, just overwhelmed. And so I said, man, how do I add stability to my business so I can get off of that stool? And it's got three legs, four legs. And that stool can hold itself. You know what? Not only can the stool hold itself, but it can hold me. The stool supports me rather than me supporting it. And that's when I sat down, Dan, I started to write down. I said, man, let me look at my marketing that I'm doing right now. And let me, let me see what type of marketing is giving like an outsized result for the amount of effort and time that I put into it. And that lasts longer. 
and only probably about 10% of my business at that time. And this is driving leads online. I was doing offline. I was doing direct mail in that company. Only about 10% of my revenue came from content online or what I today call evergreen marketing. The other 90% came from joint ventures, came from hustling and networking, came from direct mail, things like that. And I said, what if I was to flip that ratio? Like what, what if I was to flip the ratio, this 10% of my income is coming from literally like a half a percent of my work because it's stacked up and it's evergreen from work I did years ago. What if I were to flip that to like 80 or 90% of, of my income came from evergreen and only 10 or 20% came from the hamster wheel efforts? Would that give me more freedom? Would that give me more flexibility? And so that, that's, that's kind of what set off to you know, over the next two years for me to discover how do you do evergreen better? Uh, how do you create content better that's going to last for years? Uh, how much time should I, now I'm going to answer your question directly. How much time should I invest into this type of content? How do you do it? Uh, where should it go? And um, that led into Carrot in 2014. But what I suggest people do right now is this. Number one, you've got to have a vision for what type of business you even want to have. Uh, that's the very first thing. So many agents... They look at all these different marketing methods and you're going to hear this podcast, y'all, and I'm going to give you another one, right? But you're looking at all these different marketing methods and you're going, well, Johnny over here says posting on Craigslist or on Facebook five times a day works. And Sally says, if I do these three minute videos on Facebook and then amplify them with ads, that works. And this person says Zillow works and this person, they all work. Like they all work. The, the thing is we have to look at that and say, what type of marketing is going to give me the business that I actually will enjoy? What type of marketing is going to give me the type of business that is going to help me with the finances for sure, but get me off the hamster wheel so I can finally actually get that freedom, get that flexibility, make the impact that I wanted when I became an agent. And um, most of the marketing, this one thing I discovered in that time period, Dan, and I'll toss back over to you is most of the marketing that I was doing was actually, um, most of the marketing that I was doing was actually keeping me on the hamster wheel and leading me further and further away from a business that I enjoyed. And so when you're doing content, I'm going to give you guys a couple ways that you can literally do content in under 15 minutes a week that will get you start to starting to rank in Google and get you starting to get some, some traffic and leads and building that evergreen uh, lead flow uh, for sure. So on under 30 minutes a week for sure is all that you need. And the more, the more that you do, the more that you can scale it. So, uh, I, I agree with you on a lot of those points. Like, I, yeah, you want redundancy in your business. You want redundant, you know, reliability, right? So you, you need you need multiple multiple ways to get each part done, right? You need, you need yep. multiple ways to attract leads, multiple ways to convert them. Uh, you know, throughout the entire you know lead acquisition to, to closing, like you, mm -hmm. you don't want one. If one method goes away, you don't want to kill your business. So 100%. You need you need diversity and. I I like the idea too. When everyone zigs, you you zag, right? So if everyone's focused on Facebook or Instagram, right? But you're out there just crushing it on blogs, on long form videos. Um, you know, there's an advantage there, right? And then and then you know potentially, like if you have that dialed in, that's enough to feed your business. Mm -hmm. The short form stuff could be things you do on top of that, right? Just to like yep. pour some fuel on the fire, but it's not something you you have to do, which in, in, in that, and, and that's might make idea. it more fun. <laughs> well, do hundred percent, right? And, and, and that's that's where I want people to pull back and kind of write those non-negotiables, right? It's like, what what type of flexibility do I wanna have? What, what, what do I want my, want my business to do? And if you absolutely love posting on Instagram five or 10 times a day and that fires you up and you love it and that's where you're getting your business, keep doing that. Like that is exactly what you should be doing. Um, if it wears you out and you feel like you're tied to it and you're on vacations, you're like, man, I got to make my post. Otherwise, whatever happens um, or you don't take vacations because you, you feel like if you stop doing those marketing methods, your business is going to go down. Uh, that's where I want to challenge people to look at, OK, where is your marketing actually influencing your lifestyle? And one, one thing that, that we teach, Dan, is is uh, we never say, man, like we never say just do one method, just like you said, right? Uh, you should mix them up because uh, if, if you're talking about evergreen marketing, I, I just got off a, a podcast with one of our clients. Uh, his name is Eric Stanio up in Northern Kentucky in, in Cincinnati. And um, he's not a hundred deal a year guy. Uh, you know, he does about 50 deals a year right now. Uh, 100% of it's from his evergreen content uh, with a little bit of Google pay-per-click mix in. And we can kind of teach people what, uh, what, what he's doing. So you guys can do it too. 
Um, but but what, what we like to teach people is number one, your evergreen stuff, putting a piece of content online and getting it ranked in Google for phrases that your most motivated buyers and sellers are typing takes time. Like you might put that online and it might take three, six, eight, 10, 12 months, depending on how competitive it is to get up there. So the question is, now what do we do in the meantime to get leads and traffic coming in right now, right? That's your, that's your cold calling. That's all the methods you guys probably already teach and master and are amazing at on this podcast and in, in your brokerage. Those get leads immediately. They get traffic immediately. Uh, those things you should be doing 100% for sure, especially as you're working to build up that evergreen momentum. Um, but then what, what we like to see is then as you're, as you're, as you're doing those marketing methods, discover what you love to do, discover what gives you energy, discover what is giving you that consistency. And then as you go, the evergreen allows you to get off of the hamster wheel on the things that you don't enjoy anymore and start to replace it with more of the consistency. Um, one last thing that I'll mention on this, Dan, is, is people might be looking at going, well, man, I'm, I'm already doing 50 deals a year. How do, how do I get up to hundred transactions? Well, it's going to be really hard to do that with just online content like your, your offline is where you get your volume you know your, your offline is where you get your volume your sphere direct mail uh you know whatever other types of marketing offline gives you volume uh the online uh content on google gives you the highest motivated highest intent searchers with, with the highest close ratio and so it's kind of a mix there uh, you will eventually tap out your volume just by going with the seo and youtube uh, optimization and then you've got to add on outbound marketing to get volume higher yeah, I, I agree with with that. I think another another interesting point too, which we haven't hit on with uh, long form and uh, short form, um, the places where short form lives are usually platforms where people are not going to buy and sell a home. Yep. Right, you're not going to Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whatever to to, to buy and sell a home. But however. If you get something to rank on YouTube or Google, uh, people are finding it because they're typing in, mm. you know, they're typing in, how do I find a home? How do I sell a home in the city? Right. They're typing in yep. something like that, which means those leads should be easier leads, you know, as, as a whole, because they have the, they're, they're, they're intent based leads rather than ones you got through disruptive, you know, marketing. Dude, hundred percent. And if you look at like, but one of the, one of the big things right now, of course, a lot of people are focusing in on rightfully so is, is man, how do, how do we move away from Zillow? Because they're seeing Zillow make some moves that, that um, probably aren't going to be amazing for a lot of agents as, as, as things go. Uh, we also sell work with a lot of agents that love Zillow. They're buying the leads. They're closing them. Amazing. Like yeah, we, we crush it on Zillow. <laughs> and that's amazing. dude. like, keep doing it. So yeah. what, what, what we then ask people is we say, okay, cool. Um, if, if the Zillow leads are working really well, then, then the next question is how do we cut Zillow out of the middle? Um, how do we cut Zillow out of the middle? And the way that Zillow grew, uh, initially was not by launching Facebook ads. It wasn't by doing direct mail. The way that they grew is they said, where are the searchers of, in this case, home buyers searching and what are they searching? Well, they're searching these types of phrases. They're searching homes for sale in this neighborhood in Seattle. They're searching, you know, whatever. And when Zillow started, they started off at the city level, right? They started off with pages on their website that were at the city level. It was Homes for Sale Seattle. And then they would build out Homes for Sale Tacoma, Homes for Sale Arlington, going on down the line. As they started to build out all these city uh, pages, right, that have all the listings on them, then they said, well, how do we go one level deeper and get even more traffic and go even deeper down that rabbit hole of finding people who are even more motivated and more focused? And they started to go neighborhoods within Seattle and types of real estate within neighborhoods. And when I'll talk to a lot of real estate agents, kind of one of the, one of the, the things that they'll talk about and I'll, I, I investors as well, um, it's like, well, shoot, we can't compete with Zillow. Like, how are we ever going to outrank Zillow? So then let's buy those leads. And we say, well, it's going to be nearly impossible. And from our data, you know, over, a little over 90,000 inbound leads a month, most of them sellers. Um, from our data, a lot of them, tons of them are buyers too. A lot of a lot of those cities, you know, like you're not going to be able to outrank Zillow for a city usually. So sell my house uh, or, or uh, homes for sale, Roseburg, Oregon, where I live, it's going to be nearly impossible to outrank Zillow number one for that. But what we can, and we've proven over and over again, the agents can do is look in your city and say, okay, what niches am I in? 
uh, what, you know, what, what parts of the area, what types of real estate or what buyer or seller situations do I love to serve that they pay me well, I love to serve them and it's fun. It might be new construction. It might be this one neighborhood uh, that you absolutely love. It could be, you know, whatever it is, scenarios, write all those down, those niches that you love to serve. And then number two, you go, okay, cool. Every one of those niches should have a page on your website, every one of them. And where, where most agents stop is, is they stop at the city. They, they launch the, the page on their website that has, that has um, you know, homes for sale in Arlington, as an example, which is going to be crazy hard to outrank for, for Zillow. But then what I encourage people to do is go one level deeper. What about those five neighborhoods in Arlington that you're an expert in that you absolutely love? And then what about new construction, these other niches that you love? Create a page on your website for each one of those. Have you know somewhere between five and eight hundred good quality words on that page that describe your expertise in it, that describe the area. Have the IDX on there. Have an opt-in form on that page that specifically says, uh, "You th this is the this is the opt-in that we found works best in those types of pages." Is um, uh, North Umpqua River Homes is an example. So there's a, a high-end river here in town. Uh, it's more expensive homes. And if you were to Google like North Umpqua River Homes for sale you usually have our client's website above Zillow. Sometimes they trade back and forth. I was looking at, at today, Zillow had them today, but they had Zillow the last six months um, or phrases like that. You land on the page now, and then there's a, a form that essentially says, get on the list of the most, uh, get our daily updated list of North Uncle River Homes for Sale. Uh, so if, if it's river, if it's, um, you know, homes in Melrose, Roseburg, Oregon with swimming pools, same thing. It's get on our list of, you know, our, our daily updated list of homes in the Melrose area with, uh, with swimming pools for, you know, for sale. And when you start to do that, you start to compete against Zillow in spots that they can't compete well. Because if you're an, a hyper expert in those niches, in those areas, you can create content that's more robust that Zillow can't automate. Um, you can create little videos and I'll walk you through, I'll walk people through a really quick process under 10 minutes a week, documenting content you're already doing that gets ranked in Google. Um, a lot of people are taking their cell phone and doing content that just goes into Instagram or Facebook, which is great, right? It's great. Keep doing it. Uh, but then it's gone in 72 hours. How do you take that same video content and get it onto Google, which is where a steady stream of your most motivated prospects are going, um, that then starts to rank and builds you evergreen. So I'll kind of sum it up with that. But guys, you can beat Zillow for those leads that we're currently buying from Zillow at the niched neighborhood level. And we're, we're seeing it happen every single day. Uh, if you structure that page correctly. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you want to take over a city, uh, it's easier to do it block by block than, exactly. than the whole, the whole thing at once. And that's, yep. that's really how I started my entire real estate career was just going after one, one street corner and, and then, love it. then expanding. So, you know, I, I, I agree completely. I think, I think it's a great strategy. And then, yeah, I think before we kind of wrap up, I think one thing to hit on is, uh, and I know you, we talked a little bit about this before, uh, before we hit record, uh, all of these methods, you know, will probably be new or, or, or change, mm -hmm. right? So there's some challenges that you'll have in implementing them. Right. There's there's going to be some times where it looks like it's not working. Mm. And I think you really need to find ways to strengthen what, what I kind of call your your challenge muscles. Right. So mm. doing something hard, doing something new. You've yep. mentioned a couple of things, you know, that, that you've been doing like 75 hard. Uh, mm. I think I think you said last month you rode like 500 miles on your bike right in one month. Yep. Um, so like what is what would your advice to be on, on people just things they can do and maybe outside of real estate just to to build a stronger mindset that might actually help them in real estate uh even though it doesn't seem like it's connected oh dude i i, I could talk on this topic for hours but i know i know we don't have hours so um here's here's the quick on, on my journey you know over the years and kind of the last several months so uh, like Dan was mentioning, I'm doing something called 75 hard now, which you guys can Google it. It's all over the place. It's not easy. That's why it's called 75 hard, but it's two 45 minute workouts a day. It's a gallon of water. It's reading 10 pages of a book, not listening, but reading 10 pages of a book, uh, you know, eating based on some sort of a diet, no alcohol, no cheat meals, the whole thing. And when you hear it, you might go like, that sounds miserable. Why would I want to do that? 
Um, well, if you would have asked me three months ago or even four months ago, um, I would have said I couldn't do it. I would have said, man, like there's just no way. And so here, here's what I like to do, Dan. Any, anytime I'm at a spot where, anytime I'm at, at a spot where I feel like I'm hitting a wall, anytime I'm at a spot where um, I'm, I'm hitting this ceiling that I keep on bouncing against it and it just feels like, man, I feel like I'm so close, but I just can't crack through and I'm starting to lose momentum. Um, there's a, a, pro, or a, a mindset that I, a mindset shift that I, I made years ago and a concept I call uh, discipline ceilings. And essentially, if you were to look at like, I don't have my iPad here in front of me, but if you were to, you know, draw a little chart and then, you know, put some horizontal lines on there going across and then almost like a stock ticker, right? Where, uh, where when life is going amazing and things are in momentum, you're heading up and to the right and things are going good and you're going, oh my gosh, things are going great. That thing I learned, I'm never going to forget that. And I'm in, I'm in flow right now and I'm never going to be able to, I'm never going to leave, lose this feeling, right? I'm always going to be able to reach back into that into that uh, jar and be able to pull this feeling back out of momentum. And invariably, we all hit these spots in our life over and over again, whether it's every six months or every three weeks or whatever it is, where we start to lose that momentum, you know, where you start to feel, oh man, I don't know what it is, but I'm just not crazy excited about my work right now. Or you start to look back and go, man, I, I, I don't know what it is, but I'm in a funk. And oftentimes that's kind of what pops up in our minds is that we're in a funk. We're not as motivated as we were. Our energy might be going a little bit low. And usually where I find for me, Dan, is it's because I keep on hitting that discipline ceiling at that phase of my life that I need to get over. And I can't figure out what it is. And so one of the best ways that I like to get out of the discipline ceiling and start to move into a better mindset there is I have a process I call the six F's. You guys and guys literally write this down. If you're driving, don't write it down, but remember it. Uh, so you have to first recognize the fact that I'm getting into a funk and I'm starting to uh, hit my head against the wall and it's getting frustrated potentially. My momentum is getting stagnant or backwards. And you go, cool, that's my trigger. That's my indicator that I need to do something. Number two is you need to now diagnose what the heck is even wrong. And so six F's is that for me. Uh, the six F's are faith, uh, family, fitness, finances, friends, and fun. Okay, faith, family, finances, fitness, friends, and fun. And literally give yourself a one to five. Okay, one being, man, it could not be any worse in my life in this one area. Five being, dude, it's the best ever. Couldn't be any better. And I want you to go through that process and circle the one or two that are the worst right now. Usually though, that one or two is the thing you need to change to get you back into momentum, get you over that habit ceiling. So the way that I create a new habit or discipline, and usually it's a discipline that's in your way. It's usually not, I need to read a book. It's usually a discipline that's in your way from getting back up to momentum because you're cracking the ceiling on that one discipline scene. We need to adopt a new discipline that gets you up to the next level. And so as an example, going into December, you know, we've got at Carrot here, we, we, you know, we help tons of agents and investors grow their leads. And we have 45 empl full empl uh, full-time employees. I'm looking for a new uh, head of marketing. And there's all these things that are piling down on me. And, and for a couple of days, man, I was like overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed for two solid days. And I pulled back and I said, okay, you know, I'm, I'm in a spot where I can't get out of this by doing more tasks. Like it just can't happen. Uh, I've got to think about it in a new way. And there's some disciplines right now that I don't have in my life that are going to help me get through this situation. My current disciplines have got me where I am right now. And I did that audit. And essentially what it was uh, for me was I needed to bake a little bit of fun back into, into the things because I was just cranking on work and I forgot the fun part of it. And when you're just cranking on work all the time, your motivation to go deeper on there starts to wane. You start to find distractions away from that work so you need to build more fun in. And then the other part, Dan, was I need to get mentally sharp. And my fitness routine was kind of becoming dull. I was working out two or three days a week, which is just barely enough to kind of maybe maintain. And I said, I need to figure out something that I do every single day. When I can adopt a healthy habit every day, that's gonna get me to the spot where my disciplines will carry me through this next level as a CEO. And that's when I wrote down that challenge. So a challenge for me is this, a challenge is three things. Number one, it's time-based, okay? So I circled the one or two things, one around fitness, one around fun, time-based. Uh, it has to be within a specific time. Number two on a challenge is it's got to be specific. Like, what is this thing that we're doing? Number three, accountability. And so these are the two things I did, Dan, to completely rocket me past that discipline ceiling into the spot that we're, you know, I've got major momentum now. And I do this about every three to six months. It is for the friends one, I said, man, I just need to hang out with more friends uh, and, and, and on the fun one. And so for for like a year, I'd been saying, I want to get together with more friends. And so I said, right here, my challenge is this text message, you know, six friends, 
right now, set up a whiskey night for Thursday next week. And the accountability is there within those friend group. And I'm going to tell my wife, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, we're going to talk about it. So bam, challenge taken. All six said, yes, we got together. It was amazing. We're doing it every month now. Challenge number two was the fitness part of it and getting that daily routine. Cause I knew when, when you do something every day, you grow, when you do something three days a week, you maintain, you do something less than three, three days a week, you actually go backwards. And so I said, I need to do something every day. And my coach challenged me. He's like, you like riding your bike, right? I go, yeah. He goes, why don't you just ride the number of days, the number of miles for the day of the week or, huh. or the day of the month? Yeah, and calendar so, club. <laughs> yeah, calendar club, right? So the first I rode a mile, 15th, 15 miles, 31st, 31 miles on Christmas day, 25 miles, which is not easy. And the cool thing about it, man, and this is where it goes back to what you had talked about with being able to push through things is in those moments where you want to say no, when it's hard, when you're like, damn, I really don't want to do this. I really don't want to wake up at five and get, get, you know, 25 miles in before the kids get up for Christmas or whatever that number is. You go, but I committed to it. I committed to this thing and your commitments. When you make those commitments enough, become your disciplines, whether they're good commitments or not. If you commit to hitting the snooze button every day, you're committing to be a person that wakes up late and hits the snooze button every day. If you go to bed late and you make the choice to go to bed late because your belief is that you're a night, a night owl, um, then you're going to, your, your beliefs influence your choices. I'm a night owl. Therefore I'm going to go to bed late. Um, your choice to go to bed late is then going to make it so your mornings are hard. Uh, so that's become a, become a commitment. Your, your, your choices become commitments when you make them enough. And then when you make those commitments enough, the commitment to go to bed late and wake up late, that is your discipline. Your disciplines are your reputation. So I'm going to toss it back your way and ask people this question. I'll wrap is this, is I want you guys to ask yourself when you're ready to quit that thing, when you're ready to stop that thing, when you're not really wait, ready to push forward, ask yourself, who is the person I want to become and what would they do Would that person I want to become? do this thing right now, do this hard thing, or would the person I want to become go back to my old patterns and do the easy way out? So guys, have that vision for who you want to become. Your beliefs influence your choices. Your choices become your commitments when you make them enough. Your commitments are your disciplines and your discipline is your reputation. That's who you're becoming. So you got to shift that mindset, guys. No, I agree. I mean, that's, that's all uh, great stuff. Have you, uh, you considered doing the the calendar club for running. I've heard of some people do that. So you're running one. Cool. Uh, it's not necessarily like when you get to the second half, it's, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll do like a morning and a PM run. Uh, yeah. But, so I've, I, I, <laughs> that, that for me, Dan is probably that next limiting <laughs> belief I need to get through. So this would have been in the spring, um, you know, right after COVID hit uh, my, my, cause we have a gym here in the office that we built. And so we have a coach in here. And as soon as COVID hit, we shut the office down for that month of March and April, just kind of figuring out what was happening. And so that's when Dan, I had realized that, that my fitness routine was based on a location. It wasn't based on a mindset shift. And so my coach is like, dude, he goes, you need to get something going again on the fitness side of your know, physical fitness side of it, because that's influencing you as a father, as a husband, as a, as a leader. And he asked that running thing. And he said, he goes, hey, you need to do something. He goes, what, what's the furthest you've ever ran? And I go, probably like five miles. Like at once you're talking like five miles. He goes, that's not too far off from a half marathon. And in my mind, I'd always had this limiting belief that I was born with this um, skeletal condition that affects your joints and all kinds of things. And I played baseball in college, but I would have these hip issues. And so I've never been a runner because of that limiting belief. So going back to beliefs, influence choices, the whole thing, right? And so I'm like, okay, is that a real thing? Or is that a limiting belief that I can't do a half marathon? And I'm like, all right, Dan, my, like my coach's name is Dan as well. And I said, all right, Dan, I'm going to do it. And same thing, time-based. When are you going to do it? We set a date right there. Okay, how many miles? Okay, it's 12.3 or 12.2 or whatever it is. Or 13.2. 13, yeah, 13.1. Yeah. <laughs> and then he's, he's like, right now today, find out. It was eight weeks from that, the time that we were going to do it. He's like, find an eight-week half marathon plan and just do it. I did it, dude, crushed the half marathon. And so now maybe that's the next thing I need to do is I need to blast to that next limiting belief and create uh, create the calendar club for that or do a marathon. Sure. Awesome. Well, yeah, it's, it's exciting when you decide, all right, I'm going to just start doing this small little habit and then, boom, it, it, you know, you do it enough and mm -hmm. it changes, it changes who you are and, and anyone can do it. That's the cool thing. Yep. Uh, 
We've got to wrap up here, though, but I always end with the hyper fast round if you're ready for some rapid fire questions sure. and answers. All right. What's the biggest piece of advice you'd give to a new real estate agent? Man, it kind of goes back to what, what we were just talking about there. Adopt the mindset of uh, not if this will work, but when it will work and and go go through that whole thing is like, what beliefs do you need to change that are influencing your output? Uh, so it's not a matter of if this thing works. It's a matter of when it works and just keep working it uh, until it does. All right. What about uh, an experienced real estate agent? Biggest piece of advice for them? Dude, I think the biggest piece of advice for them goes back to something else we were talking about too, is asking yourself, is this business actually fueling my passions and making the impact I hope it would? Or is it just cranking out great money and wearing me out? Um, if, if it's something that is actually fueling your passions, if it's something that gives you energy, uh, you do this podcast probably because it gives you energy. There's something about it that you're doing that, that your real estate business didn't give, didn't get, didn't give you probably. So I want all the experienced agents to ask that. Why did I originally get into this? Is this business as it is today giving me this? If not, what do I need to change? What, uh, what do you think real estate investors should be looking for right now? Dude, so um, a, few, a few different things. So real estate investors should be working with agents a lot more and vice versa. Um, there, there's, there's a little bit too much tension sometimes between, between the two factions when at the end of the day, the best way to serve a seller oftentimes is to be able to give them multiple options. So investors need to be working with more agents, but number two, man, um, creative finance. Uh, so as we head into this next cycle, uh, whatever it's going to look like, I mean, I think we all have some guesses and probably pretty educated guesses. There's going to be a lot more foreclosures hitting the market sometime, probably back half or end of 2021, if not the start of 2022, depending on how far these moratoriums go. Um, there's going to be a lot of sellers that need help. Uh, there's going to be situations where the traditional real estate transaction uh, listing on the market or even a traditional wholesale deal or, how, or fix and flip won't work the traditional way because there's no equity in the property potentially. Prices are really high. And I think there's some people overspending on stuff right now. And within the next uh, 12 to 24 months, you're gonna see a lot of opportunities pop up where creative finance subject to done right and ethically are gonna be an amazing tool uh, in your toolbox. Yeah, and I've had some people on the podcast um, that you know build a whole business around creative finance and uh, just allows them to, to do so much more for an underserved part of the market. And, and they've really built some huge businesses doing that. And mo most investors and agents throw those leads away, right? Because they're like, oh, there's not a deal here. There's no equity in it or whatever. And so if you guys want to build a really great business and carve out a niche that is way underserved right now is understand how to do subject twos ethically and honestly, understand how to do wraps understand how to do owner finance or, or um, yeah, seller finance because, and then go, then go network the heck out of investors and agents and then just find out from them, Hey, what deals, like send me your deals. You think that there's not a deal and let me look at it and then share in those profits with them. You'll be like their best friend because they're throwing those leads away. Yeah, no, definitely opportunity there. What uh, was the biggest challenge you've ever faced in business and how did you overcome it or what did you learn from it? Dude, I, I think I think my biggest challenge was, was this was um, this was 2016 when, when I had to make the decision to it, it was like, do I continue treating this like a lifestyle business and dial things back? Because carrot started to grow really, really fast at that point. Or do I actually treat this like a real business and learn how to lead and learn how to really build a team? And so before that time, Dan, it, we were probably three or four people. And now we're, you know, north of 40 and we're going to be hiring another 10 to 15 this year. And it's hard, dude, like, because you have to go, you have to, as you know, you, you, have, you have a big team. It's hard because you have to go from you having the mindset of doing everything yourself into the mindset of, oh, shoot, not just delegation, but how do I actually lead well? How do I coach well? Um, and that's a big mindset shift and it was hard, but it's way worth it. Yeah. And I, I think that's one, a lot of real estate agents that are successful struggle with and, and never really even like take a swing at unfortunately uh last one where do you see yourself five years from now oh man dude that, that that's when i wish i could answer it with clarity so I'll, I'll give you a high level is um as as a father i've got six eight and ten year olds right now and um five years from now they're going to be you know in or close to their teens and i want i want to i want to 
intent intentionally be at a spot where my business um, is not something I have to work in daily. And at least as, as we are right now, I'm making the choice to still come to work every day. Um, but in five years, I want to be able to spend more and more time with my family. I've got the ability for it now, but we're, we're in a spot at carrot where it's like, all right, let's, let's just keep, keep jamming on it and building the team. Um, the, the next thing, man, is I absolutely love mentoring. And I, I think everything happens in phases and seasons. I, I'm in the season right now with carrot and with my real estate investments and other things where I'm in build mode, but I can't wait to be within, let's say five years to be in the, the mentor and invest mode. Awesome. Well, Trevor, this was uh, a great hour. We went, we went like an hour, which is uh, awesome. Uh, didn't feel like that for sure. So um, thank you for the value though, that, that you brought to the listeners today. If people want to learn more about your services, how you can help them or, or just connect with you or, or your company, like what, are, what how should they do that? Dude, uh, carrot.com. We've got all kinds of free content over there. Find me on, find me on Instagram, uh, Trevor.mock. That's M-A-U-C-H. And on, on the evergreen side of it, I think one of the best free resources that we have is if people just go to carrot.com forward slash evergreen, uh, carrot.com forward slash evergreen. There's free resources there, um, all kinds of stuff that they can dig into and, and learn more about how to add that to the mix. All right, guys, check out carrot.com. Check out Trevor on Instagram. And thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening, watching. Please leave us feedback, like, comment, share, all that good stuff. Uh, let us know how we're doing. We'd love the feedback. And thank you for listening in. And thanks for being on the show, Trevor. Awesome. I appreciate it, Dan. Thanks, man. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Hyper Fat Show. Subscribe to us if you want to make sure you get the latest and greatest Hyper Fat Shows. And remember, we love reviews. Reviews help us bring better and better guests and improve our shows. So give us the good, the bad, and the ugly. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we will see you next time. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around to the end. I hope you enjoyed that video, and if you want to see more, click right here. And if you're new to this channel, click below to subscribe and turn on post notifications so you don't miss out. And leave some comments about what you think on the videos. I'll see you next time.